and welcome back to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I'm really excited because this is one of our, or was one of our original uh, and the very first Fintech Focuses that we did over a year ago when we first went into lockdown. Uh, it's Thomas McHugh from Finborn. Thomas, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. How are you, Toby? Very good indeed. Thanks. Very good indeed. Lovely to have you back on the show. I remember this, uh, you know, our, our episode because I thought it was it was really interesting. It was it was right where companies were still wondering where we were going. It's probably about 10, 11 months ago now. And you guys were really robust, really positive about your your attitude to taking it on, growing the business. And again, you know, this this uh, this year you've been uh, been noted as one of the companies in the financial technologies most influential financial technology companies. It's been a very strong year. Everything I've seen, read, heard about with the Finborn story continues to go apace. And so massive congratulations to that. We'll come into all of that and the various obstacles, challenges, opportunities and everything there, there in, in a minute. But before we do that, just give us a brief recap of Finborn and yourself and, and, and the company, if you would. Sure. So we're a four-year-old company. Um, we started with the idea of structurally changing the cost of investing for everyone. And we did it by looking at what, how the financial technology landscape operates in capital markets. And we believe that, that there's been this structural problem where efficiency is an issue for most firms. We end up in this scenario where just figuring out what you own and how much it's worth is a really difficult job. I don't know if you've talked to many asset managers or hedge funds out there, but literally figuring out how much cash they've got in the bank at the start of the day as a result of trades that may have worked, may not have worked, market data, regulatory complexities, you name it. And, and just figuring out those two very simple questions is, is something they all struggle with. Yeah. So we started out with, with the aim of changing that and doing it in a way that is developer-led, uh, productivity-led, efficiency-led, and, and operations-led, so that you have a platform on top of which you can build a very efficient company. And we believe that the net beneficiaries of all of that would be the end investors, because you can see it everywhere, right? The, the industry is one where transparency requirements are going up, where the requirement for efficient use of capital is going up, where the requirement for transparency on, on, on what you're investing in from an ESG perspective is going up. And even that whole need for data from your regulators, data from your end clients themselves is going up. So mm -hmm. we're trying to help sort of facilitate and smooth that transition. I think I've, I've said this in, in a few episodes recently where we've been looking and interviewing companies who've appeared on the listing again. And, and this, this sort of common golden thread that I talk about throughout all of it is, is you know, some of, some of it is about the market and the technology and the sector you're looking at. And data, as we, as we know, is a, is, a, is a very precious area at the moment and something where there's so yeah. many different opportunities within it. The other thing that I'm really fascinated about is this, this whole concept of efficiency. Because it is a it is a problem that everyone's having throughout all of capital markets, all of finance. In fact, probably any business, any anywhere, with increasing costs, increasing margin pressure, and and the need to to make a uh, you know a much more efficient way uh, and usage of, of doing business. And to me, the companies who really focused in on that and been laser focused on what they want to do and how they can create those efficiencies have been real beneficiaries of the last year in particular where companies have really been pushing for that. Have you seen that, you know, Fim Fimborn's been an incredible story all the way through. And I, I, I remember talking about this last year with you, that I think it's been one of the companies that really caught my imagination over the last three, four years in terms of its growth story, because it's solving a problem that is a genuine problem to, you know, that the, the, the market has. How's that, how's that sort of accelerated over the course of this year for, you know, for you guys? Because it would have grown anyway. The company would have developed. It's been on a growth story for each one of its, you know, three, four years that's yeah. been in existence so far. Has this been something that's, that's sort of accelerated that for you guys, or has it been something which is, you know, you've still grown impressively this, you know, this, this year, would it have been more so uh, without, or has it actually helped fuel the growth of the business? So there's a general trend, as you say, right, for, for, for data, right? I think what people are starting to realize is that there's a big gap between data and information. And yeah. What people are trying to do is get information from the reams of data that's available. Now, the problem with that as a, as a sort of, <clears throat> as an overall sort of aim is that, is that when you get some data in the door, you've first got to figure out what does it mean? Right? You've got to figure out, you know, I've just had a, a load of transactions from my, from my fund account and or some photographs um, um, uh, uh, of a shopping center, right? The, the, the classic analogy that people use now for, for alternative data. 
you've first got to figure out where does it belong, right? And and there's a whole raft of, of issues around that, right? There is, you can put metadata tags on it, you can sort of, you know, put it into a data lake, you can house it just in case you need it later. But the problem is always with, you know, if I need it later is a very complex question. What do I need it for? How do I know I've put the right tags on it? And even more important than that, and the thing that people miss most of all, is you've got all this data that you've put in these really important operational data stores, your books and records for the last 10, 20 years, your your list of customers who who could have been customers, almost were customers, weren't quite customers. You've got a list of you know potential areas you can get your older alternative data to be useful for you. And you've got to t- turn it all into information. So why is it that people look at it and look at, you know, photographs of shopping centers as something that's valuable to get information out of, but don't necessarily look at their books and records as something that's mm. important to get information out of, or even worse still, they don't look at it as all equally valid when it comes to running an experiment. And at least in our experience, the reason why that happens is because it's a technology impediment, right? You've got all this really new sort of data warehousing technologies and all these new sort of AI and ML technologies, and they're very good at taking in the alternative data. They're very good at searching Twitter, looking at Google, looking at something that has an API, but none of your old sort of you know operational data, the most valuable data to your company, fits into that picture. And that's what we're trying to change. We're trying to say, right, you know, it doesn't matter whether you've got books and records from your, your old systems, you've got books and records from your fund accountant, you've got, you know, a security master sitting somewhere in the corner. It should all be equally as available to that sort of set of, of learning technologies as, as everything else. And, you know, yeah. there are really great toolkits out there. There's, you know, uh, TensorFlow, there's, there, there's Spark, there's Solar, there's great kit out there for AI and ML. We're never going to be that. Right? We're not mm. going to we're not going to outspend and and outcompete Google. I mean, as much as I'd love to, that's that, that's one never going to be <laughs> one day. Yeah, but I think it's 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 a hell of a, a of a climb that one. But what we are going to be able to do is basically take the data that you have operationally and make that fit for purpose as the world changes. That's really what yeah. we're after. I think there's I think that's that that comes the critical part, doesn't it? Because there there is so much talk of data, and my my view, however naive it is, it is or otherwise, is is despite all the talk, people really haven't got their heads around about what they what they really want to do with it, how they really want to take that further forward, and how they can take data into information, and then information into insight, into actionable, you know, work that makes makes the whole process better. So there's been a big flurry of talk for many years. Uh, well, you know, particularly over the last five years or so, where where all the conversations being data, data, data. But I've always thought, right, what's actually the, the purpose of people saying data and what they're trying to do with it to make moves further forward that improve that efficiency, that reduce that cost, that make them better and, and the yeah. customer orientation better. And I think that's something which you guys have always been very clear about. What's and, the and actual opportunity behind what we're doing there, right? Yeah, you do see this this um, trend everywhere, right? You see this this whole idea where what you read about is, you know, uh, firm XYZ has just managed to, to find a new insight by running this correlation or this regression test or this machine learning model or, you know, something of that nature. But what they don't tell you is under the hood, they had all the rest of their data available to them to tell them whether or not that that new model was efficient. And that's the bit that, that, that sort of we think everyone should have access to. We think that, you know, that kind of kit is available at the minute to the sort of tier one of funds and the tier one of banks. It should be really available to everyone. And this is this is quite an interesting thing that we've been uh, speaking about earlier on as well ab- ab- about your approach to that. With you know, and you say look, tier, tier ones. You work with large enterprise business businesses through to you know small new funds, etc. As well, but yeah. uh, but I think that that sort of common ground and the uniform elements to it are things which you've also really focused in on as as well. Tell us a little bit about what's happening there and some of your thoughts. In that yeah, so way. so right back to, to, to what I said people struggle with, right? They tend to struggle with, with what do I own and how much is it worth? And there's a number of reasons for that. The world is very simple where, you know, I have a portfolio where I bought some equities, right? I bought a, a share in, 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 in Google and um, I did it 10 years ago. Good for me. Um, it became Alphabet. I now own some Alphabet and you can go and, and look at the, the, the stock exchange to figure out how much that's worth. It's a very simple question, but it becomes a real problem when actually what I bought was a hedge fund and it invests in something else. And, mm. and I, actually, I bought some real estate and, you know, that an even more complex structure to try and model in your equity books and records system. And I bought some government bonds because 
or some inflation protected government bonds because I'm worried about, about a bubble post crisis and, and I think I need some inflation protection. And there's all these sorts of things where as you start to sort of increase the investment complexity, which everyone's now doing, right? You see, even in the world that we're in now, right? You see, you know, the, the, the private equities have stepped down to become VCs, the VCs of uh, the tier one VCs have stepped down to start doing, you know, series A and seed funds and, yeah. and everywhere, everybody's doing a little bit of everything now to try and, and bring that alpha into their portfolio. And yeah. given that, you need a technology that's capable of servicing all of that. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a private asset or it's a public asset or, you know, it has risk measured in, in sort of factors or risk measured in terms of, in terms of visual asset Greeks. You need a platform that can cater for all of that. And, and, and we've had a look around and we don't really think there's one out there. So we trying to step into that breach as well. So you come into, come into it. And that's, that's been a sort of nature of the beast for you guys since inception, right? It's been looking yeah. at where the, you know, where those gaps in the market have been and how you guys can you know, fill it and, and provide the solutions to it. Does that continue to sort of evolve? I mean, the business has, has evolved a lot over, for over four years. Yeah. We, we're, we're trying to be... maintain that premise, isn't it? It's been. Yeah, absolutely. We, we tried to build something. Somebody described it one of our, our early uh, VC backers described it as we're trying to cross a desert, right? We're basically trying to build a platform that has now 400 different API endpoints in it that can do accounting and can do valuation and can do aggregation across disparate data sources and bring together a data virtualization engine that's basically something akin to a Denodo or a Snowflake and yeah. build an identity and access management system so that you can't actually, by accident, violate a market data um, uh, license or you can't you know leak data and and we've got to do all that whilst building a security infrastructure that not just small firms would be happy with but but the biggest of tier one firms are out there and and that's huge right it's an enormous build and and for us we're still not there yet we're, we're very much still a work in progress and probably will always be a work in progress right as i said we've we've got 400 endpoints we've got a very secure platform we've got lots and lots of capability we've expanded our client base enormously over the past year and now what we're after is basically doing more of it right we yeah. want to make it so that it's it's ever easier to use the problem is when you build a platform like ours, now what you've got to do is make it accessible to everyone, right? You've got to make sure that people can turn up and, and do really, really complicated bits of, of, of analysis, but do it in a really simple way, right? The power yeah. of an, a lot of technology companies now is you can ask Siri or, or ask Alexa, right? And, and what they do is they take a terribly complex problem of searching for, for songs and, and searching for the weather and searching for time and figuring out what it is in your location and turn it into a very simple, what time is it Siri or what time yeah. is it Alexa, right? And, and that's where the beauty of it comes in. So we want people to be able to, what do I own? How much is it worth? And what does the regulator need to see and when can they see it? And, and yeah. all those sorts of simple questions need to be answered and they need a very complex infrastructure to make it look simple. Yeah, that, that, that I think is fascinating. And gen genuinely, I think that sort of ability to, to make the complex simple is behind so many great companies, you know, full stop, particularly in, you know, in tech where you can, as you, as you say, looking at, you know, all of the, those sort of companies, in particular Alexa and Siri and, and taking very, very complex sort of scenarios and, and presenting them. So it becomes easy for the user with it. With, and I think this goes across, you know, mankind at the moment, everyone is looking for an easier way of, of delivering everything because of the digitalization that we've seen over the last decade or, tw or 20 years even. Yeah. And there's a, there is a, a user um, who, you know, in their home now has everything on a plate handed to them and, and living and particularly as you see generations come through who are used to that digital way of of uh, of, of expect you know expectation yeah. it comes into every aspect of what they do and how they do it so the the ability to, for that to cascade and to really provide opportunities and see that going across into the you know the financial world i think has been on a bit of a lag and I think it's businesses like yours at the moment who are able to do that. And I think this last year in particular has been an accelerant to that, to, re to really allow companies to recognize that they've got to be more efficient. They've got to be more client orientated. They've got to look at some of these problems and simplify. And that's seen a big, big swell of companies collaborate to be able to be open to partnering with smaller you know, four-year-old businesses, et cetera. And, and it's been a, a sort of the, the ability to, to see that that grow for SME businesses, I think has been really, uh, really positive because it does mean more collaboration. It does mean procurement's potentially slightly easier. 
it does mean you know particularly with it, all the developments and apis and such like that we've been able to see a lot of advancement with com with, with companies there and you know particularly capital markets companies who are seeing better tech stacks that are more suited to the actual requirements of the you know the traders the users the uh, fund managers who are looking to do better things with, with you know, on their day to day it's it's become yeah. massively emancipating almost uh, in terms of how people go, go about and do their job and within that comes comes some sort of significant opportunity and this is something i'm fascinated about because look you guys have always been innovative and, and that's been one of the sort of key words of uh, you know you'd associate with finborn over the course of the course of the last four years it's also been a business that I think has been very much focused on its its culture, its its people, how you've had a you know from from effectively going off a kitchen table to then uh, it rapidly accelerating through a number of different offices. Finborn to me has been been a sort of real case book of of a of a tight knit culture that's been that that's done really well because of its people and because of its ability to attract great people and and then being able to put bolt more of them on. This last year hasn't stopped that. You've, you've sort of grown, as yeah. always, with, with uh, phenomenal pace. And you were saying earlier on that now this will be, in the next couple of months, the, new, the newers, uh, um, the yeah. pre-COVID, the, the post-COVID crew outnumber the pre-COVID crew, crew in the business, which is a fascinating scenario to, you know, to be in in the growth business. Tell me everything you've learned <laughs> over, the, over the course of the last year about managing remote teams, about onboarding. We spoke last time about you just starting to go through that journey, bringing people into it. Embedding it, you had some success at the start with uh, with doing that. You were ahead of the curve in terms of seeing the opportunity to bring in good talent at that sort of stage. You you haven't let up on the, your uh, foot on the accelerator of doing that. Yeah. What are some of the uh, the successes and, and wins and learns you've seen over that period? So I'll talk about some of the failures first, right? Um, which is <laughs> something I think um, people don't do enough of. The biggest risk we've seen over the past year is that life becomes a bit transactional, right? Mm. Um, you end up in the scenario then where people's efficiency drops and, and they end up, you know, turning up to meetings and to some extent forgetting there are people on the other side of, 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 of you know, the screen, right? So it's very easy. Um, and we notice this in a number of ways, right? People don't switch their cameras on. That's the first one. And, and mm -hmm. therefore, they're probably slightly less engaged or slightly harsher than, than, than they would otherwise be in, in, in a meeting room with people. Interesting. Um, yeah. The other part of it we've noticed as a challenge is, is the lack of a release valve, right? So, so um, we used to have uh, Wednesday games, right? So where, where everybody would take an hour out and, and, and gather in small groups and play games together, just, just because Remember, it's yeah. an important sort of release valve. Um, we'd obviously have a, a set of people. We had Friday pizza. We had people who, who liked to go to the pub. We had people who had our, our Harriers club who went running together. We, we had all that sort of stuff where it's very, very important for, for people to sort of interact at that kind of level. And the biggest challenge is that we've done stuff like, you know, we've gone on Discord, we, we've created sort of, you know, virtual games rooms, but it doesn't have the same level of, of what I'd call the release valve. Mm. And as a result, you end up having to force that sometimes, right? You end up having to be in a scenario where you've got to, you've got to basically push people together and almost make sure that you cause some of the friction to make sure that something actually gets released right yeah, yeah. Um, and that's actually probably been been one of the, the the failures and also one of the things we've learned most from it because i think people will tell you and, and and i've seen it right you see a lot of these things where people come on and they say it's been brilliant we've done town halls or it's been great like like we do right we do a tea bot where you get somebody chosen at random to have a coffee or a tea with them um, and um, once a week and that sort of stuff is very insightful and, and it's really great that you keep the connectivity with people, but it's kind of a bit stilted, right? And, and it doesn't provide the release valve that, that, that we've noticed. And, and for us, that's one of the things, one of the reasons, I guess, more than anything else, we're looking forward to the end of, of COVID. Hopefully June yeah. 21st sticks, right? But, Fingers but, crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed. It seems to be moving the right way at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and interest, interesting from that. Yeah, there's companies there, particularly in, in your space, where they're saying, look, you know, we've, we've learned about you know, efficiencies within that. People have been been productive, and and you know, some of them have said, you know, categorically, we're not moving back into the office. But you've sort of are, are doubling down and, and looking for more space and bigger space. Yeah, which is interesting. So talk, talk to me a little bit about your thought process behind that as well. It goes back to that, right? There's a task level efficiency that we saw go up, right? So, so from an onboarding point of view, we've always been remote first, right? We've always been bring your own device. There's always been a, a sort of, you know, a capability to leverage technology that people have sort of moved into en masse 
since this has happened. So that was never an issue for us, right? The, yeah. the, the bit as well where we do sort of um, all hands meetings every two weeks, we, we do lots and lots of, of presentations. We've always been very open as well, saying anybody can come to any meeting that they want to, as long as they've got something to add to it. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then, then absolutely, that, that, that's always been the case, right? So we haven't struggled with that stuff. But outside of the task level efficiency, we've noticed sort of an overall decline in sort of what I'd call organizational productivity, right? Yeah. You end up in this scenario where the germination of a new idea, they're just, you know, we haven't found a replacement for people standing at a whiteboard and sharing an idea. We haven't found a replacement for the, the serendipity of the water cooler, right? The, the, yeah. the oh, you're doing that, oh, I'm doing this. Wow, those th- things sound the same. That sort of cross-pollination of ideas and, and, and leads to an efficiency that you just can't replicate virtually, or at least we haven't seen it yet. And, yeah. and, and a year into it, we think that that's the thing we're missing most, more than anything else. So. Have you, phys- have you guys physically been in the office at all during that sort of period? or, or We've had an office or? open the whole time, right? And yeah. We've had a, a place where some of our junior staff can, can go or anybody who needs to have a meeting can go. Obviously, yeah. it's always been, you know, within guidelines and socially distanced and all that kind of stuff. But it's been important to us for a number of reasons. And one of them is a, a few months into it, we realized that we had a whole bunch of staff sitting in a bed sit with the, their laptop on their knees, struggling just just sort of survive, as it were, right? Mm. You know, needing somewhere else to go. So we're like, well, we could, we have a, a space. It is empty as long as you stay within the protocols and, and, and do what you're supposed to do. There's somewhere you can go because we've got to the point where we believe that that was essential, right? It's not essential for everybody. It's not just a free-for-all where you can go into it. You have to book in advance and all that kind of stuff. But there are a cohort of people who do need to get out of the, the, the room. Otherwise, it, it could be very you know unhealthy for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that sort of individualization has been has been important to recognize people, at, you know, with the various different challenges that, that people, because, it, it, you know, this this isn't the same for everyone, for mm-hmm. reasons we've been said. And, and you know, if, if right at the very start, I think there's an awful lot of people working on ironing boards and, as you say, laptops on beds and all that sort of thing, which is yeah. Which is difficult, right? And and we I guess both of us are fortunate enough that we live in a nice neck of the woods. We 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 have um, you know a garden that kind of stuff. And yeah, but yeah. there's an awful lot of people for whom that that's not true, right? And yeah. and as much as as you know, it's been mentally tough on everyone. If you had nothing but but four walls to look at all day, I, I can't imagine yeah. how tough it is. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think people have seen seen that without without question. Let's let's talk about that culture issue. And that you know culture part part of two tribes effectively and 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 how you've managed that because as you say look the befores and the afters um there is a uh, there's a very real opportunity or, or possibility to have two camps you know the people of of the pre-covid era and the, and, and the post-covid era, era yeah. uh, coming in, coming into the business and have, have you managed and and what are your plans to sort of assimilate those to those two groups to really uh sort of I guess develop a culture from there of, of of that collaboration. Does it happen by purely going back into the office and all of a sudden everyone you know has that has that osmosis and that connectivity, or is there are there things there that you're doing to make sure that that's you know less of a less of an issue? So we're planning for the worst and hoping for the best on that one. Is probably the, <laughs> the, the 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 way to look at it. And what I mean by that is is um, we're creating all of the infrastructure. So we're calling it our our Finborn University, right? And and we're upping the level at which um, new joiners get training, both for sort of core constructs in the industry we work in, as well as for sort of you know training for for the stuff that's important to us right so yeah so here's where you go if you have this kind of issue here where you go if you have this kind of issue that 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 sort of you know infrastructure we're, we're investing a lot in to make sure that people when they are onboarded you know do have a mentor do have you know some somebody to to, to talk to should they experience any problems as well as somebody to go to for kind of career advice right because we're a bit unusual as well that, that we don't we don't view the world as one where come to us and you're going to spend your entire career here. I mean, that'd be brilliant. That'd be great if that were true, but we see the world more as we're sort of temporary custodians or temporary helpers on the journey of your career, right? Your career Mm -hmm. is yours. And we think we've got something exciting to offer, but if we don't, you know what, we'll help you get something else that's more exciting for your career. Um, Now, when it comes to the people who are here pre and post, we've seen a very big split, right? We've seen this scenario where, the people who are here post lockdown are much more transactional, 
in the way that they view the interaction with us as a company, right? We've heard very positive feedback, right? The onboarding experience has been great. The capability for them to get up and running and be productive quickly is great. But I notice when, when I talk to people, they're less sort of aware of some of that view that we have as an organization, like, mm. you know, that we're just here to help you as much as you're here to help us. We're, we're, we're here to make sure that we are, you know, temporary helpers in that career that you have for yourself. And that's the kind of stuff that's much harder to sort of, you know, get across to people um, when you're not actually seeing them, when they're not in the room. Because as I said, you know, we, we've got a hundred people who turn up on an all hands call. I mean, if, if, 50% of those are actively listening, I'd be surprised, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, as you probably told in the last five minutes, I tend to drone on a bit. So <laughs> I'd be surprised <laughs> if anyone's actively listening at the end of one. So I'm still here at the moment. I'm still here at the moment. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> but it is difficult, isn't it? That communication yeah. is, is a really, a really tough part. And I, I, do, I do it myself that when we do our, our town halls, I'm sat there and, and I can't stand not being able to see everyone. I find it really difficult not to be able to read people's faces as if you were addressing a room there's, and, there's a really uh, important part of that toby right and um, which is which is the thing that i think i probably miss most of all right if you are which 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 uh, i know you are good at reading a room right you'll see the person who's dissenting in the room right yeah. and you'll be able to engage them appropriately and and yeah. and you cannot do that over 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 zoom or over teams and i think that's a tiny microcosm of where problems can start and build when when there's probably an easy solution to it and it's almost always a misunderstanding right yeah yeah and it's and and the, those are the other sides of it communication i think is the, the over the companies that have done very well over this period with that uh, are ones who've recognized the need to over communicate because yeah. that constant drumbeat of information going through to people is is you know people will get crumbs and they'll take a various you know various that we did our monthly our q1 kickoff our q2 kickoff just before easter and i'm very cognizant of having delivered that how much will actually uh, will be in and how much different areas need to be recalibrated and re recommunicated again in different forms because even saying one thing there'll be a, a trigger that someone's heard that will be completely different from uh, the other part yeah. of that same same sentence that someone have heard the other half of that, that that piece and i think it's a really interesting dynamic and and problem to you know to, to deal with uh, as we approach this to be able to get things you know get things moving for, you know further forward as we as we move back into rehabilitating inhabiting uh, offices again do you think moving further forward that you'll have a, a you know a flexible model will it be a hybrid will it be back oh, yeah. into to more in the office what's what's going to be the optimum for for returning for this and what's so the behind that if you have a look at at um the way that we've seen the world sort of evolve and the biggest thing we need to cater for is people meeting their colleagues to be productive, right? So mm. that whole idea where, where you know, we're going to end up back where we were before, I think, is, is not true, right? I think yeah. there's probably a structural change in how people work, but it's not the one that, that, that sort of, you know, people are forecasting, right? Everybody's not going to be in the garden for the rest of their lives. That's just not the way the world is going to work. And everybody's not going to be back to exactly the way they worked previously. I think what you'll find is there'll be some sort of, if, if I were gambling, I'd say 70 to 80% of people coming back on any given day, right? So I think yeah. the central London will be maybe 70 to 80% as busy as it used to be from a, from a commuter and working perspective. And within that, the difficult part for every given organization has got to be to figure out what works for their people most in terms of meeting uh, the right cross section of their company and meeting their own team regularly enough to be productive. And those yeah. are sort of the drivers, right? With, within that, what you've got to then figure out as a company is how do I get the logistics for all of that correct so that we can say, let's stay at 70 or 80% um, um, capacity. And yeah. from that perspective, you'll still have an overflow. So we're going to end up, even for us, with an office that's a bit more friendly towards breakout areas, that's a bit more friendly towards, you know, meeting rooms with, with whiteboards where people can discuss. And we're going to be a li little bit less sort of structured in terms of how we, you know, keep hours or, or, or days of the week and, and that kind of stuff, right? It's going to much more have to be about how we get people who need to be together to solve problems together into a space where they can do that together and then not have to be there for the rest of the time. So when you talk days of the week there and, and, and hours, what does that, what does that look like? So you end up in a scenario, right? Where, where 
even as we come out of this stuff, right? You're going to have a bunch of people who don't want to be on a train during rush hour, right? Mm. You're going to have a bunch of people who who don't want to be, you know, underground, right? Uh, on, on rush hour, who don't want to be on a bus in rush hour. And from that perspective, we're going to have to have some flexibility for that as well. People can come in early, come in late, but it is important that you know we 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 tend to structure. You know, this team is gonna is gonna have uh, this section of the office for the the next week, so that they can sort of drop in and out and 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 have an overlap on on at some point on on a Tuesday and a Wednesday, and then the rest of the week the the space is theirs. And you yeah. need to do that because at the end of the week you have to clean it correctly so that the next team can have the space for for the following week. And mm. and you know the logistics to this thing are probably the hardest part of it, right? Um, the, yeah. the ethos is easy to talk about, but but fitting that in with the logistics is going to be the, the most difficult part. Yeah, there's definitely challenges that, that come along with that. But it's but I think look if we can uh, if we can uh, drive through the challenges of the last 12 months and these ones become yeah. ones which are uh, slightly more palatable to be <laughs> to be able to but look could at be there well. for quite a longer time, right? I don't know if you heard the, the the prime minister in his speech yesterday, right? You know the 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 sentiment is very much like like yes, we're gonna we're, we're on the roadmap. Yes, we're gonna be back by June twenty first, but. Um, I think the the masks and restrictions and that sort of stuff will will, will long last long after after June twenty first, as it were. Oh, so. Without without question, because no one wants to go back. Do you know that's that's the other side of it. This is yeah. this is not something which people want to have to do to do and go through again. So very interesting. Right, let's 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 look at, at Finborn to wrap things up at, at the moment. Very very exciting last four, last four years for you. That doesn't seem to be slowing down. Tell us no. a little bit about <laughs> tell us a little bit about what what the next year looks like and and you know, 2022 and the plan moving further forward what's what's the what's the future hold more basically is <laughs> is, is 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 the one way of putting it as i said we we've tried to uh, sort of address this space in a very unique way it's very platform driven it's very long term in in our approach to it and for us the the, the marker of success isn't one where we sort of create a business and sell it in a few years from now it's long term structural change and yeah. from that perspective um, growth is our friend We'll expand internationally this year with, with with the right tailwind. We're trying to double our workforce again this year. Um, wow. We're trying to get yeah. We're trying to get to the point where we can actually service customers um, in a way that is sort of beneficial to them because we believe in a model where partnership is very very important. Right? It, it's not just about sort of you know building a product that that that's best in class. You also have to build an engagement model that's best in class. And you have to build efficiency at the your customers as well, right? Because our ethos is one where we believe in sort of you know long term structural change and efficiency driving that. That means we we don't have a model where we we effectively loan out or or, or sell our people. It's one where we we train instead, right? Where we we bring yeah. other people on the journey and try to make everybody more efficient and bring everybody up the curve, as it were. And from that perspective that stuff needs infrastructure. It needs people, needs infrastructure, needs money in terms of oxygen to fuel the journey. All that stuff is is, is basically what the next year looks like for us. Right? So exciting times. Yeah, very much so. No signs of, no signs of slowing down. No, um, despite the, the request from my, my other half and kids. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me some time back. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear it. It's been a, it's been a fascinating story ever since uh, ever since you start, started. And I think, you know, when you when you spoke there about doubling the team again this year, look, it's, it's sometimes a, a, one of those sort of flattering statistics when you look at smaller companies about how they've grown by 200 percent or uh, you know, 100 percent, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of headcount or profitability. And it gets more, uh, more you know, steadily more challenging as things grow through to go from 10 to 20 obviously is less of a leap than to go from 100 to 200 200 people and and i think it's just inspiring it's it's been one of those businesses that just seems to have got almost everything right throughout the uh the, the sort of journey that you've gone, gone through so, so far and i know you'll always be there and uh, sort of pick the bones of that and talk about the you know, the, uh, the failures as much as the successes but I've, I've loved seeing this this sort of journey of what you guys have achieved and, and i'm so pleased that it continues to grow and develop at the pace it has done so Look, always an absolute pleasure i'm so pleased that uh, that it's uh, continues to pace if people are there and want to get in touch who should be talking to you at the moment and how what's the best way of them reaching you anybody who works in financial services as an asset manager as, as a hedge fund as an asset servicer just reach out and, and and contact us you'll see it all over our website where to get in touch right or or email me right? i'm sure you can put that up afterwards so Certainly happy to. Certainly happy to. Listen, lovely talking to you. Thanks so much for the candor again. I, I feel like I always come away with a 
wealth of wisdom and, and thought from these conversations. And, uh, you know, this was, this was absolutely one of those ones where I just find it massively invigorating seeing, you know, seeing those sort of stories and hearing the, uh, the tales of people who, who you know, come through this with, with such strength and, and opportunity. And again, coming back to those golden pathways of what you look at, those threads that are common to some of the great businesses that have, uh, have moved through this, this period. I don't think there's any surprise as to, as to why and how you guys have done so well. So and I'd say thanks as well. So we Absolutely honestly, so, you yeah. guys have been a great partner on the way. So oh, well, it's very kind of you to say so and uh, looking forward to plenty more of it as well. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon on our episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. Thank you.